You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products like Venom heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperrice.com. And gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. I do thoroughly apologize for uh, missing the show yesterday. I, I, I thought I could make it work. I thought I could play Civ all night and just relax and give myself the night off and then wake up early enough to do the podcast, and I was wrong. I could not get up early enough to do the podcast. I set an alarm for 5, slept through my alarm, woke up at 7, and it was too late at that point. So, my bad, but that's all right. Um, The most important thing is that we get the pregame podcast up and running, because that's the one that's the most fun to do anyways. I do want to give a shout-out. Like I mentioned, I did three different Bears podcasts. Uh, Always have a lot of fun. It's, It's at least my second time with all of them. But uh, the Bear Essential Podcast, Bar Room Network, and Bear Report, all three of those, um, lots and lots of fun. If you just can't get enough of my uh, beautiful, sultry voice, you can go check those uh, fine podcasts out. I always, like I said, I, I always have a lot of fun with those guys. And as I mentioned on all three podcasts, or at least tried to make sure I got the point across to anybody that's coming over to this podcast that heard me on those and wanted to check this out, I apologize. Today is not going to be a fun day because I'm just going to make fun of the Bears and say a lot of things that make you mad. Just understand that that's how Sundays go. Sunday is all about let's forget about the possibility we lose because that's silly nonsense. Today, The greatest team in the history of the world, the Green Bay Packers, is playing the worst team to ever grace a football field, the Chicago Bears. And that's not necessarily the Bears, it's just whatever opponent happens to be in front of us. I enjoy it. I think it's great. I figured before we kind of rip this thing off, we should look at the uh, final, as far as we know anyways, game status for everybody. Um, Probably already know this, but Kevin King is officially out. Dennis Kelly is officially out. Elton Jenkins is questionable. It was looking real optimistic for him, but uh, it's down to questionable. We'll see how that plays out. I'm hoping that's one of those. He's uh, 98%, but we're going to call it questionable so that the Bears have to kind of adjust because it is hard to figure out the Packers' offensive line. Even if um, Elton isn't playing, it's like, all right, I think I know the starting lineup, but you never really know what the Packers But if you don't know if Elton's even playing, then it's like, all right, we kind of know the offensive line if Elton doesn't play. I mean, we've seen it, so we just assume it is what it was before, but I guess you don't 100% know. And then if Elton plays, I mean, he's probably going to be a tackle, but maybe not. And then watch the Packers put him at guard just to spite the Bears because they probably didn't even prepare for that. I doubt they would do that, I'm just saying. Um, Out for the Chicago Bears, Caleb Johnson, linebacker, J.P. Holtz, tight end. Nothing super massive there, but they have a ton of questionables. Um, Bears fans are mostly optimistic, uh, especially when it comes to Khalil Mack and Allen Robinson. They pop up on this injury report somewhat regularly, but usually soldier through and, and play the game. But Allen Robinson, Khalil Mack, both questionable. Uh, Allen Robinson did get back to practice on Friday. He was limited. Khalil Mack did not practice. So even if he plays, um, he's got a foot injury. He hasn't practiced all week. Um, Maybe just one of those things we need to keep him off his feet because, you know, it's a foot injury and whatnot. Better better to have him not practice and come in cold than to have him running around on his injured foot. Um, otherwise, Akeem Hicks is somebody that seems like there's a little bit. He was limited on Friday, so it kind of feels like he would play. But um, if there's anybody of the major players that it feels I feel some pessimism from, it might be Akeem Hicks. Otherwise, uh, Xavier Crawford with a back injury. Duke Shelley um, is their slot guy, so that's kind of important. He's also got an ankle injury. He's been full participation, but he's listed as questionable, so should play, but we'll see. Justin Fields was taken off the report. I don't think there was ever any uh, doubt that he would play. 
Otherwise, uh, Jakeem Grant, Ryan Nall, Artie Burns, and Eddie Jackson, uh, for the most part, the last two at least, popped up just on Friday for the first time. It was uh, kind of funny yesterday when I did the uh, the Bears podcast. They were, <laughs> I, I, you know, I had mentioned Ryan Nall and how he's basically never played, but I assume he's going to have to to kind of help take some of the load off. They basically said, not necessarily that there's no way, but uh, they're going to be real mad if they see him on the field at all. So I found that pretty funny. I didn't know it was that bad of a situation with Nall. But anyways, uh, Danny Trevathan, also known as Rashawn Gary's twin brother, is uh, off the list as well. So he should be back this week. But anyways, let's 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 get down to the nitty gritty here. It looks like, by the way, the Packers are now minus six. I'm guessing that has to do with the injuries, which are more heavy toward the Bears. But that's a that's a pretty big shift. Either way. There is a general fog over Packer fans right now. Not Bears fans. Every Bears fan I've talked to, aside from the obnoxious Twitter ones that I've talked to, has basically been like, look, I would love a victory. I, in fact, I would kill for the ability to have Justin Fields win against the Green Bay Packers. I mean, the whole thing would just be like an I- idyllic dream. And I understand, I 100%, I mean, let's just let's just take two minutes to be a Bears fan here just to picture how big this game is for them. It's not nearly as big for us. It has been 30 years of bludgeoning the Chicago Bears, and I, that's not hyperbole. 30 years of repeated bludgeoning. The Chicago Bears are, are there's two things going on right now. Number one is watching the end of Aaron Rodgers' career. Maybe that's not necessarily this year, but they know it's winding down, and there's not a ton of optimism around the league, aside from a couple straggling Packer fans that like Jordan Love, but there's not a, a huge belief, even if Jordan Love is good, that he's going to be the next Brett Favre Aaron Rodgers, right? I mean, just statistically, clearly that's that makes sense. So if he leaves... There, there's the opportunity to, to fight for something other than second. And I understand they've been first a couple times, but you know what I mean. Bears fans know what I mean. Everybody does. Let's not get lost in the weeds here. Not only that, though, they drafted Justin Fields, who is somebody that they are unbelievably excited about. In fact, many Packer fans that listen to this podcast are furious with me because I spend so much time talking about Justin Fields. And, and again, the only reason I do is because of how unbelievably unrealistic Bears fans have been about Justin Fields. I fully acknowledge that there may be a time when this guy is just unbelievably good, and I'm scared about that. I'll fully admit that. But that time is not right now. And But, but that's the reason I've been talking about it. But again, the only reason I keep bringing it up is because so many Bears fans are so unbelievably excited about him, they can't even be patient enough to wait for him to be good before they declare that he is good. The fact that they didn't bench Dalton and play him and the fact that they haven't just cut him loose makes Bears fans furious because it never even entered their mind that maybe he's just not ready for that. So the excitement factor is there. So so picture that. Chicago is, they're already excited because they feel like maybe next year is the beginning of a new era. But what if it starts today? Again, we're, I, I just want to be in their shoes for a minute. Just just give it a couple minutes. Just to understand the magnitude of this game. Even though a lot of Bears fans are just hunkered down thinking this is going to suck, there's still that feeling of if if Justin Fields beats the Packers, if if and if we get real crazy here, and I even posed this on the Bears podcast yesterday, if Justin Fields is able to outperform Aaron Rodgers because of the Bears' defense or whatever, and the Packers go on to win... That is just going to set, I mean, that is going to be the greatest thing that can happen for the Chicago Bears, at least until it all comes crumbling down because the Bears are poorly managed and they can't build a team around Justin Fields and the whole thing. But aside from all that in the future, this will be, I mean, we joke sometimes when we say like, oh yeah, that's your Super Bowl. Literally, this is going to be, as far as many Bears fans in their entire lifetime, any Bear fan that's like my age or or maybe a year or two older that would not remember the Bears the uh, 85 Bears, this is as good as it gets. This is as good as it's ever been because of what it symbolizes. So again, understand how big this game really is. Even if they're 90% thinking this game is just going to suck and if we can just you know inch out a win here, that'd be great. 
Make no mistake, if they find a way to win, it's going to signal to them, and not just them, you're going to hear it all over the media, the media that has been pumping up Justin Fields since day one, who's done nothing yet. He hasn't even done anything, and they're in love with him. I still say the, 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 one of the funniest things I've ever heard, they had one of the announcers, one of the games I watched, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, oh, I think it was against Cleveland, actually, because it was just he was getting eviscerated and didn't do anything the whole game. They praised him for what a great job he did recovering one of his own fumbles. I mean, it's, it's that level of pathetic that the media is going to to praise Justin Fields and how great of a football player he is, despite the fact that he just hasn't done anything. He's done nothing. He's been, at best, mediocre. And that's, that's me being generous, saying that he's been mediocre up to this point. It's been kind of a disaster. Not the defense. The offense. It's, a, it's, it's the 30th-ranked offense. How much credit can you give a quarterback on the 30th-ranked offense? Well, it's not the quarterback's fault. Okay, well, you love your running back, and you love your wide receivers, so whose fault is it? You're telling me you're 30th with a great quarterback, great wide receivers, and great running back because your offensive line is that bad? Come on, man. Come on, man. It's a little bit your quarterback, isn't it? It's a little bit your quarterback. And again, that's fine. That's fine. I get it. But it's a little bit that guy, isn't it? But, 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 but again, the, the, the hype will get ramped up, I mean, I, to 12, let's just say. It'll get ramped up to 12 if the Bears win this game. If, if the Bears win the game and Justin Fields is mediocre, he will be the next Pat Mahomes, I promise you. And if they don't say Pat Mahomes, they'll say Russell Wilson or maybe somebody that's a little bit more his style of play. He's kind of a Russell guy, right? I guess, I guess Mahomes kind of makes sense too. He's not Lamar. He's not that athletic, but he's athletic. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. Russell probably seems more like a comp to me. Doesn't matter. It, it, they'll say whatever they want to say. In fact, I think somebody even said he's a mix between Lamar and Mahomes. That might have been a Bears fan, but, but again, this is how crazy things have gotten. But that's how much this game would mean, right? Because they're all just kind of waiting for the inevitable. Here's the flip side of that. And again, there's, there's really no way to fully crush their dreams because a lot of Bears fans have resigned themselves to next year is when things will get better. You know, Rodgers will be gone, theoretically, right? It's whatever. And Justin Fields will be in year two, and that's when this thing will explode. But we can maybe get them halfway there. We can get them halfway to not just the crushing realization that this year is not our year, but maybe it's just never going to happen. Because here, let me, let me lay out another scenario for you, Chicago Bears fans. One that's not quite as, as fanciful and magical and beautiful. Let's just leave aside the whole part where Justin Fields was a panic pick by a, a couple of guys that are worried about if we don't find a quarterback to play for this team, we're going to get fired. And he fell for a reason. And let's just forget all of that. And the fact that he was taken after a lot of the guys that are also playing like garbage. Let's, let's just assume Justin Fields is good. Let's say Justin Fields is Deshaun Watson. I mean, as a player, right? Better human being and good player, right? And Deshaun is phenomenal. I mean, real good. The problem is the Texans are so trash, it didn't matter. And what was so bad about the Texans? Well, I mean, they had J.J. Watt, and at times they had some pretty good defenses, but the offensive line was terrible. They did have the best wide receiver in the league, which you guys don't have, which kind of stinks. But outside of that, depending on what year we're talking about, it was pretty bleak. The run game was really non-existent, probably largely because of a terrible offensive line. But the bigger issue was over time, due to horrible management, the one thing that was a big asset, the Houston Texans defense back in the day, I mean, you know, three, four, five years ago, whatever, became one of the worst defenses in football because things started to erode and they didn't find anybody to fill those shoes. And you had kind of a banged up J.J. Watt playing by himself. And guys like uh, Whitney Merciless and, and those kinds of names became horrific football players. And so you look at a team that has Khalil Mack, who is aging and although still a very good football player, is not exactly 2017 Khalil Mack. He's still real good. He still can mess some stuff up, but he's kind of, he's kind of just one guy. And he's not the elite of the elite. Same, same thing you could say with J.J. Watt. That dude will mess up your day. But he is not peak J.J. Watt anymore. Akeem Hicks, aside from, let's forget the part where he wants to force his way off this team real bad. The guy's just getting old, and he's not the same guy he used to be. He's, this is not 2018 Akeem Hicks. And so we're looking at a unit that is 31-year-old uh, Robert Quinn. Akeem Hicks, is the, in the last year of his contract, is 32 years old. Khalil Mack is 30 years old. 
Uh, who else do we have that matters on this team? How about Danny Trevathan, who's 31 years old, and uh, next year is the last year of his contract? I mean, the rest of the linebackers outside of Roquan. You've got 30-year-old Alec Ogletree in the final year of his contract, 30-year-old Christian Jones in the final year of his contract. Your corners are already gone. I mean, you did bring in Jalen Johnson. We'll see what he can do. But all the other guys that you had that were really good are already gone. Duke Shelley you just drafted, but he doesn't seem to be the greatest football player. Eddie Jackson you guys gave a ton of money to. He hasn't been getting it done. Deshaun Gibson is 31 years old. He's in the final year of his contract. Uh, DeAndre Houston Carson is 28 in the final year of his contract. Deion Bush is 28 in the final year of his contract. He can't keep all these guys. And this is the strength right here. This is the strength of your team. What about the weaknesses? How about the fact that Allen Robinson's in the final year of his contract and doesn't want to be there anymore? Jakeem Grant, Marquise Goodwin, Brashad Perriman, uh, Demir Bird, all of them are free agents next year. Tight ends, Jimmy Graham, J.P. Holtz, and Jesse James, all of them outside of Cole Komet, who's proven nothing, are free agents next year. By the way, you got to pay some of these guys some serious money, guys like David Montgomery. He's proving to be one of the better players on this offense, one of the things that makes it go, right? That's what you guys have learned. This is a run-first football team. All right, well, David Montgomery's about to get paid. How about this entire offensive line? Guys like James Daniels. He's only 24. You got to pay him, right? How much do you think James Daniels is going to go for? Probably more than you're going to want to pay him, but you can't let him go. How about 39-year-old Jason Peters? <laughs> 39. You going to sign him again? Because you got Jermaine Effetti and Elijah Wilkerson are both free agents after this year. You, who, you, that's three offensive tackles, all of which, by the way, are playing. It was Jason Peters and Jermaine Effetti, both free agents next year. Jermaine Effetti went on IR, and now Elijah Wilkerson is filling in in that spot. You got to pay him, right? Are you going to pay Akeem Hicks and Allen Robinson and David Montgomery and Elijah Wilkerson and Jermaine Effetti and James Daniels and Danny Trevathan and Tashawn Gibson? No, you're not. Just like you've been purging corners that you desperately need, you didn't want to get rid of those guys. You had to. And you're going to have to do that again. And, and the point is, like all teams, same thing I've been saying about the Chiefs for a while. Ask anybody that's been listening to this podcast. I said the Chiefs are going to start deteriorating. And the reason that I knew that is the second they got rid of John Dorsey, the problem is you got to find somebody that can do as good of a job as John Dorsey. It's great that John Dorsey built that team by himself by drafting those key pieces. He built that team and made it what it is. He also built the Browns and made them a contender. The fact that that guy can't hold down a job, he must be the most miserable human being on earth. So one reason I'm worried about the Lions. But when he leaves, you got to have somebody in that place that can build a football team. At the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. It's great to have a quarterback. But guess what? The Packers have had a quarterback for a very long time. And we went through a dark period. You know what that dark period was? It was a period in which our GM, Ted Thompson, great GM, was going through a little bit of a rough patch. And he kind of just didn't seem to have it anymore. He didn't really have that edge. The drafts were not going very well. And it didn't take very long for things to start to fall apart. That's when we brought in Brian Gutekunst, which, by the way, the reason he got the job is because the owner of the team or the, the you know CEO of the team picked the best drafter. That's it. That was the one criteria. He wanted to see all their notes on the previous draft picks. They wanted to know who they liked, who they didn't like, and all that stuff. They looked at Brian Gutekunst's notebook and said, that's our guy. And guess what? He's built this team back to what it is. At the end of the day, you can't just have a quarterback. Quarterback is incredibly important. A head coach is incredibly important. Look at uh, Aaron Rodgers and Mike McCarthy compared to Aaron Rodgers and Matt LaFleur. Night and day difference. You got uh, Pat Mahomes, yes, but you've also got Andy Reid. You got to be able to complement this guy with proper coaching, proper play calling. And you guys already know you don't have that with Matt Nagy. And that's fine, but you still have to find that. The point is, you're so far from home. The idea that we're just going to coast down and take over the division, why? Why do you think you're going to take over the division? Because even if we lose Aaron Rodgers, and even if Justin Fields is better than Jordan Love is, we have the coach. We have a great play calling and innovative play designer. We have a GM that's done a great job building a roster. We have youth all across our, our rosters, offense, defense, special teams. And if I had to pick between a team with a quarterback, a bad head coach, a terrible GM, and a bunch of aging players that want off the team, or 
a team that has a good GM that knows how to find talent uh, in the draft as well as in free agency, a good head coach, and a young, we don't really know yet quarterback. I'm sorry, I'm taking the Packers. It's not good enough to just say we have a quarterback. And by the way, you don't know if you even have a quarterback. You, I, I, the, the amount of optimism you guys have is admirable. To say the least, it's admirable. I, 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 the amount of respect I have for Bears fans right now is incredible because you guys going through and listening to the love you have for players is staggering to me because I don't understand it. You know, we'll, we'll go through the offensive line which is doing a bad job, and we'll list off the names, and it's like, oh, I love that guy. Packer fans could learn a lot from Bears fans. I hate to say it, but it's true. Because we've got guys that are good football players that make mistakes once in a while, and we hate them. Hate them. We had had a reliable, decent tight end for many years that made one mistake in the playoffs and was getting death threats. And granted, Bears fans would probably do that too, but, I mean, it, it, it doesn't matter. Rashawn Gary has done nothing but come in here love this team with everything that he's got, do nothing but work as hard as he possibly can, and half this fan base cannot stand the guy. I think I think most, there, there are several players on this team that non-Packer fans have more respect for than Packer fans do. So I admire the respect you have for some of these guys, but I'm sorry to tell you, there's a reason you guys don't win football games, and it's not because you have a great roster, and it's not because you have a great head coach, which you know, and it's not because Bill Lazor is the greatest offensive mind in football, and it's not because you have a great GM that's done a great job drafting and all that stuff. It's because you don't, and I'm sorry, it's not just that we've had terrible quarterbacks. That's a big part of it. And yeah, in 2018, if you had a better quarterback, you had a real shot because that defense was once in a lifetime, but that defense is gone. That defense is long gone. You have a good defense now, but there's a lot of teams with a good defense. I mean, just based on points, you guys are seventh, which means there's six teams with better defenses. And uh, there are not six teams with worse offenses, which means pretty much every single team with a worse defense, with the exception of maybe one, is overall better than yours. So a really good defense is not enough. And even if, even if you guys have the number one defense in football, and maybe you'll get there, it's not good enough if you're 30th. And I'm very sorry to tell you, you're not 30th with a good quarterback. You're not. And and by the way, I would be happy if you were, because that would just prove my point even more so. A quarterback isn't enough. And and, and just, just take a minute and think about this. Forget the fact that I'm a bitter Packer fan, right? Just set that aside. You can hate me now, but when you lay your head on your pillow tonight, think this through for just a second. What is it that gives you hope? Really think about that, because I know Justin Fields does, but but really think about that. Think about the roster from top to bottom. What is it that gives you hope? What, which part of this team gets you the most excited? From top to bottom, how, how does this work? Because it's not just 2022 we got a shot, right? Because you don't want to go to becoming an all-in football team, right? I mean, that's where the Packers are because we're, we're theoretically, because of Aaron Rodgers, at the end of our rope. You should be setting up a team that is good for the next 10 years. How do you get there? What's the plan, right? Because, again, if this is just about in 2022, we're going to go all-in, spend all the money, ruin our future cap to go and win in 2022, that's crazy. But if that isn't the plan, and we're going to play it cool, and we're going to slowly build this the right way, how does that play out in your mind? Are you going to rebuild this offensive line from the the top down? Are Are you going to get brand new wide receivers. I know you got Mooney and Mooney's solid. I, I'm not going to argue with that. Maybe to the degree that he's good, we could debate, but probably wouldn't anyways. I like Mooney. I think he's a good football player. Do you really think Allen Robinson stays? He doesn't want to be there. And even if he does, next year he's 29. So, you know, uh, again, he's not a part of the, the five to 10 year plan. He's a part of the two year plan. But again, that's all in time. If we're really building this for a long-term vision for Justin Fields, we would be considering letting Allen Robinson go because we don't want to tie up way too much cap in one wide receiver because we're so desperate. Because we're not. We're building for the long term. But again, who's the GM that's going to get you there? Which is a big part of the reason why I'm, I'm annoyed with your ownership as just an NFL fan. Obviously, as a Packer fan, I'm not because I think it was the wrong decision. As just an NFL fan, I'm annoyed that you didn't fire the GM. Because you're allowing this GM to make decisions that are going to impact the next several years of your team 
that the next GM, who hopefully in your case is competent, has to deal with, and in some cases might have to fix, and that means tearing some things down. And if he doesn't, then he's, he's not really serving the purpose of him coming in and fixing the team. Because if, if, if he comes in with the condition that you can't just tear this team down because I want the team to be good, okay, well, then I can't get rid of the dead weight. I mean, are you telling me I can't get rid of Akeem Hicks? Are you telling me I got I to gotta pay him or what? Because if I'm a GM and I'm coming in, I'm, Robinson is gone. Rashad Perriman and Marquise Goodwin are probably gone. Maybe Marquise we can bring back kind of cheap, but Perriman is one of those journeymen that's ma- maybe at this point he's making nothing. I don't know, but we can't just keep paying up. These are all free agents, which by the way, again, Ryan Pace just completely botching everything. He, he went the same way the Ravens did for many years. Every year we just bring in piles of new free agent wide receivers and it just it never really worked outside of Allen Robinson, obviously. But again, that was like his one move and it's like, all right, let's do this every year. Let's bring in Jakeem Grant. Let's bring in Marquise Goodwin. Let's bring in Brashad Perriman. And there were several others before that. I'm, I'm blanking on who exactly they were. Who was that speedster out of Atlanta that you guys had for a while? So, so I guess in summary, before we go to break, here's what I'm saying. This year, despite the optimism, is not your year. Although this may also at the same time be your best chance. Although it makes absolutely no sense, I think you might need to start adopting an all-in strategy. Which would make sense because Ryan Pace knows he's about to be fired if he can't continue to win some games. And you guys have been winning a few games. But you're going to have to push in a little bit harder, I think. And ultimately, it's not going to work and you're in a lose-lose situation. Because if Ryan Pace adopts that and they go all in and they start getting some free agents and they start making moves to make sure that they win today, he's going to stay. And then you're never going to build this team. He's going to do the same thing the Rams do. He's going to give away all the picks because it's his favorite thing to do in the world. Trade up, trade for players, give away all the draft picks, and then our team is old and broken down because we have no young players because we don't draft anybody. And then we turn into the Vikings and and really just pay our guys that are you know, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. We just keep paying them because if they leave, we don't have a team anymore. So we become hyper-obsessed with signing these guys um, that used to be really, really good. And... Um, I think after today, you're going to realize that everything that you're excited about, and maybe you won't come to this realization today, eventually you'll come to this realization, but today will be a step in that direction and realizing this year is not your year, and it'll never be your year unless and until after this year, which is an utter failure and an utter disaster, we fire Pace, we fire Nagy, we fire Mr. Laser, who's been on 75 different teams in two years for a reason. And we go out and we get lucky enough to do what the Packers did and hire a really good head coach and a really good GM. And if we can do that, and I'll readily admit, if you can do that, of course you have a chance because that's, that's the most important thing. You get a guy that can build a football team and give you really good players and a guy that knows how to coach them. That's, that's really the only thing you need. Granted, you have to hit specific things. You have to hit on a quarterback, right? I mean, it's cool if you can hit like guards and, and linebackers and stuff. You got to get that quarterback for sure. But that's, that's the main thing. This, there's somebody on Facebook, you know, they got those stories up top. And I don't know why I've never, I don't think I've ever looked at a story, but one of them is some lady who I don't really even know. She is giving me a death stare. And I know it's just like a picture but it's, it's been, she's been doing it the whole time. And I'm only on Facebook because Brady's supposed to be sending me a link. Um, oh, he just says, sent me a text here. It says link should be coming soon. But it's the only reason I'm on here. And she is just glaring at me. Like, what did I do? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Also, I think there's something on my screen. There is. It, I, it, it looks like she has a scar on her cheek. And that's freaking me out. Like, dude, did you get like cut with a knife? No, there's just a little like a hair or something stuck on the screen. I don't know. But anyways, uh, we'll take a little bit of a break. I got to hang out with Brady for a minute. We're going to do a test because this is like our, I'm not even kidding. We've tried like nine or 10 times to do post game shows after Packer games. We've really never been able to do it successfully. A couple times, I think we've made it all the way through with no issues. Maybe, maybe zero. I don't know. But for the most part, it's been a whole lot of, Ryan's going to be joining us any minute now. Let's see. Let's check the link. (laughs) And it's just, it's not working. And it's it's 100% like Facebook's fault and technology's fault. We're, Brady's not doing anything wrong. It's just, here's how you do it, and then it just doesn't work. But he has the ability now, I guess, because Facebook is just unloading this, or this new technology, which I'm excited about because I've been wanting to stream to his Facebook page as opposed to some random thing that you have to click a, click a link to that eight people go to. 
But now I guess they added the ability to do a test stream so that it's not actually streaming. So you can just make sure it works. And um, so hopefully we can get that all worked out. But uh, why don't we go ahead and take a break now that I've kind of laid the groundwork for um, why Bears fans should just be depressed in general. Right. So my goal is for Bears fans to not even care about the outcome, because even if you win, still the Bears, man. And we're still the Packers. And that's just the way it goes. You might win. Aaron Rodgers might leave, but we got a guy that knows how to find talent, and he'll find us some talent. And we got a guy that knows how to coach, and he's going to be able to put our guys in a a place to succeed. And you don't. And I'm very sorry about that, and I wish you the best. And I'm glad that this is an important game, and I'm glad it's the Super Bowl, and maybe you'll get lucky and win it and have some hope and optimism and all that, but it's just not reality. So I do want to give a big shout-out to Mr. Gabriel Lee for uh, upping his pledge tenfold on Patreon. That's a, it's a big jump, man. I really appreciate that. It's a big commitment. Um, I, um, I'm just stunned at the amount of people that are willing to help out, willing to pitch in. And, um, you know, it's funny because it's my dream. You know what I mean? Like, this is what I really want. It's just crazy to me. I've got, what is it, 260 patrons right now? 260 people. And there are people that support me off of Patreon doing other stuff. I'm sure there are several people that have tried to help by inviting people to the Facebook group telling their friends, um, maybe just giving on other platforms. Just kind of blows me away, you know? Like, I'm, I, I beg you guys to care about my dream to be able to do this full time. And I'm so excited that we're kind of almost getting there. I mean, there's, there's actual light at the end of the tunnel. I, like I said, I had that big meeting with the guys who own the network. And they're, they're, they're very busy because they're being acquired. So <laughs> this podcast is a part of a major company. That company was just bought out for several million dollars. I forget what the exact figure was. Many millions, I think over 10 million, 18 million, something like that, by Libsyn. So technically my network is owned by Libsyn right now. So they're a little busy dealing with that whole acquisition and everything. But um, one of the biggest companies in podcasting is now uh, the parent company to my network. So it's pretty crazy. And um, so again, I, I had the big meeting saying, look, I know you're busy but you have to pay attention to me and you have to find me advertisers and you have to make me money. <laughs> and, and that's just the way it's going to be. And I will pester you and annoy you every day unless and until you make that happen. And it's kind of working a little bit. And I'm not usually that guy, but fortunately I work in a field where people do that to me all the time and I hate it, but it really is effective. They will not leave me alone. And they will bother me and pester me. And the more things don't get done, the more they ramp up the heat. And what that forces me to do is start coming down on other people. Because usually I'm like, hey, man, like, it's, it's no big deal. But like, they keep bugging me about it. Can you can you figure it out? And they're like, yeah, whatever. And then when everybody starts getting upset and they start getting my boss involved, that's when I pick up the phone and call them and be like, if you don't fix their problem now, I'm going to flip out. And it's not because I'm mad. It's just, dude, I'm getting in trouble because you're dragging your feet. I don't think so. So I, I guess the point is I've gotten a little bit better at, um, I don't know, being a jerk, I guess. I don't want to be a jerk, but... At the end of the day, not that anybody cares about this stuff, people care about themselves. And I don't mean to say everybody's selfish, it's just you you have your own things to do, you have your own task list to do, and you're not even going to get through your own task list of things that you need to get done. And uh, at a certain point, when you have people in these kinds of environments, you have to kind of make people care about your priorities and say, I know you're caring about your own stuff, I'm going to make you prioritize me now. And that sounds bad, but... You're just not going to get anywhere if you don't if you don't do that because nobody cares. Aside from the 260 people, nobody cares. They're too busy. You gotta make them care. I don't know why I do the Biden whisper. It's such a weird thing, but I do it too. It's what you gotta do because if you don't do it, then it's gonna be crazy. And is anybody even here anymore? <laughs> Thank you for joining me on Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. We'll take a break and we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, 
Real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. All right. I never know when I go off on these tangents if this is like a tangent that people are going to be like, that was a good tangent, or like, what is what is happening right now? I don't know. I just tell you what's in my brain, man. Sometimes what's in my brain is interesting, sometimes it's not, but I'm going to talk about it anyways. I'm sure there's at least two people out there that heard that and are like, you know what? He's right. I got to start pushing people a little bit more. Unless, unless, now don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about your wife. Don't do that. This is for business only. Because those people, it's fine if they're mad at you. You got to be okay with people being mad at you, not your wife. If, if you got that impression, get that out of your head right now. Happy wife, happy, happy life is the most true statement I've ever heard in my life. I was that guy when I got married that was like, I ain't going to have somebody boss me around. I ain't going to tell me what to do. I'm my own man, blah, blah, blah. Pfft. Miserable. Miserable. You're just going to do what you're told, and that's it. Women are so gifted at making people miserable, it's unbelievable. Like, it's a superpower. Like, I'm not saying just in general. I just mean, like, if you do something wrong, like, guys are not good at this. Like, a guy will just get in your face and say, here's what you did wrong, and here's why you're stupid, and then you look at it, and you're like, oh, yeah, I guess. And you move on. That's not what women do. They don't do that. They make you hate your life for a really long time. Every day, the anxiety of it all, the stress and then you just get to a point where you get broken, like like house trained, where it's like, uh, I'm not going to do that. Nope. I'm not answering that in the way that I feel like I should. I'm happy right now, and I want to stay that way. It's crazy. Some more advice for, for the, uh, the young folks out there. You be your own man in other ways. I'm my own man on this podcast, right? And that's, I get to do whatever I want. It's great. Maybe that's why I like having a podcast. My rules. Ha ha. So when people message me, they're like, you shouldn't do this anymore. It's like, guess what? I'm going to do it even more now because it's my podcast and I do whatever I want. I literally can come on here on a Wednesday and just talk about aliens for an hour and then say, have a great day. Bye-bye if I want to, because I can do it if I feel like it. But that's not how marriage works <laughs> at all. Be your own man when you figure out which direction you want the stripes to go in your lawn when you mow the lawn. That's, that's up to you. You want to go like up and back and then do a diagonal the next week? Go for it, man. Probably looks sweet. You want to put a little tapatio on those tacos? Mix it up? Maybe a little cilantro, no onion? Pfft, whatever you want to do, man. They're your tacos. Anyways, you get the point. I'm just trying to save a young man's life. That's it. That's all I'm doing. Before we get into the nitty gritty of everything, the, um, you know, matchups and whatnot, I want to highlight one thing in particular. 
Do you remember how bad the Steelers were? Now, when we played the Steelers, it was it was very simple. They have a very potent defense, especially the pass rushers. Um, but the good news is their offense is quite bad. We did struggle a little bit with their defense, um, but fortunately we got bailed out in a lot of ways by how incredibly terrible that offense was. The Pittsburgh Steelers offense is ranked 27th in points and yards. The Chicago Bears are ranked 30th in points and dead last in yards. So when I say that we've already gone up against really good defenses, when I say we've already faced potent pass rushes, that's absolutely correct. We have not faced a uh, an offense this bad, which is staggering to me because I feel like the Steelers' offense that we watched was the worst offense I've ever seen in my life. Somehow, the Chicago Bears' offense has been worse. I don't know how that's feasible, how that's possible, but it's really bad. The only two teams that are worse offensively right now are the Miami Dolphins and the New York Jets. That's it. And again, in terms of the uh, yardage, there's nobody worse because they're they're dead last. In fact, they're 109 yards behind the Miami Dolphins. So, I mean, the, obviously the only thing keeping them in the game is the defense and probably special teams giving them better field position than some of these other teams. They have less ground to cover. So, we, we, I mean, we've got some, uh, some people out, but the offense that is somehow worse than the Chicago Bears, the Pittsburghs, uh, excuse me, the worse than the Steelers, I mean, the Steelers scored 17 points. So I just want to lay the groundwork for just how bad the Chicago Bears offense really has been. And you can say, well, they've gotten a little bit better here or there or whatever the case may be and ignore the injuries, I suppose, to the right tackle, the two starting offense uh, running backs. Uh, you know, injured wide receiver who hasn't really gotten going at all and and play the game where we got a lot better. But, I mean, the results are the results, you know. It's not like the Green Bay Packers were, well, week one was the one bad week. Well, no. I mean, that was 14 points. You scored 20 the next week, six the week after that, then 24, which is your highest, and then followed that up by 20. It's been a pretty common thread here of, I mean, six was the outlier, which was just a couple weeks ago. You scored 20 this week just like you did week two. This is not this does not look like a team that's getting better every week. This looks like a team that's a solid, staunchy, stingy defense and uh offense that can't score a lot of points. Again, 24 against the Lions. That's it. But let's take a look at the matchup. And let's start with the the hardest part first. Our offense trying to go up against this defense real quick. Um, again, the, the biggest issue we're going to have is Mack and Quinn on the outside going after our guys. Now, if Jenkins is back, that obviously is going to help, but you still put a big circle around Khalil Mack up against Billy Turner and you start to get a little bit worried. Now, again, we've gone up against top tier talent. Again, at the time, TJ Watt was the number one pass rusher. Cam Hayward was the number one defensive tackle. That's what we already went up against when we face the Pittsburgh Steelers. Here's the issue, though. And, and again, I, you can't argue with the results, right? The results are what the results are. You can probably argue with the quality of the offenses you've gone up against so far, but we'll, we'll even leave that aside. It is what it is. Bilal Nichols is ranked 54th. Eddie Goldman is not ranked because he hasn't even played enough yet this year, but he has a 39 overall grade. Blackson, the other defensive tackle, is a 58.4. Now, that obviously assumes Akeem Hicks doesn't play, and it changes that dynamic if he does. But even Akeem Hicks is not the same guy that he was. Beyond that, Roquan's got some athleticism. That creates problems, right, in terms of trying to get out to the outside. But Roquan is not a perfect player, and I think the big disconnect that Bears fans have with Roquan Smith's 50.3 overall grade, rated as the 58th best linebacker out of 83, and the results they see on the field is all the stuff they don't see. One of the things that was talked about yesterday that I I think is the the biggest reason I did not like Roquan coming out of college is everybody that touched him threw him back 10 yards. He's way too small, way too light. I said uh, any linebacker 
that goes head to head with a quarterback and the quarterback drives you backwards is not a linebacker that I want. That's Roquan. And so they see same, same thing with a lot of these really fast athletic linebackers. You see the highlight reels, you see them sprint across the field and break up a pass or go from one sideline to the other sideline and blow up a running back trying to get to the outside. You see all that and you think this is a special kind of player. And that's true. But what you're not seeing is the fact that that 10 yard run only happened because Roquan can't get off a block. You don't always know when things go well, why they go well. It's not like you're going back and saying who was responsible for that. Especially on a running play, you usually just throw your hands up and go, oh, come on, guys. Now, if you want to go back and analyze the film, then that's that's a separate issue. But I know for me personally, when you're watching the game live, unless they go on an in-depth replay and you kind of look at it and go, oh, it looks like that guy didn't hold his gap or whatever the case may be, you're not really seeing it. Here's the thing. One of the things that the Packers have been able to do quite well that's been pretty effective is throwing to the running backs in the flat. Roquan is the kind of guy that's going to be able to get there. But here's the thing I'm wondering about. Roquan in the flat, trying to make a play against A.J. AJ Dillon. He's got the speed to get there, but is he going to bring him down? I wouldn't mind that matchup. Let's try it and see how it goes. In addition, the cornerbacks. Again, Johnson has done a decent job. He's actually ranked at right now as the 10th best cornerback in football. He's a second-year guy. Uh, was he a second or third-round pick? Uh, second-round pick, and he, he's having a good year so far. Devontae Adams is the number one wide receiver in football, and you got a couple of safeties right now that out of 84 safeties are ranked 74th and 79th. This is one of the worst safety duos in football right now. They're not offering a massive amount of help, and so this is a different kind of a dynamic. It's a different kind of offense that does a lot of different things in a lot of different ways, and if you have weaknesses, they can exploit it. That's what makes the Packers offense good is that they're so multidimensional that Whereas if, if, you're, if your offense does one thing really well, let's say it's just like the Bengals who they played, where you got a quarterback playing at a pretty high level and you got some talented wide receivers and, and whatever, right? You, you can attack that a certain way. And if it doesn't work, then, I mean, if it doesn't work for the offense, then you're kind of just doomed. If you're so unidimensional, maybe the Bengals are a bad example because of Mixon. I think he played in that game. You're going to have a hard time against the Bears. However, the Packers are not. Just Devontae has a lot of ability. Devontae can be a slot receiver. He can be a traditional X receiver running just quick routes. He can be a deep threat. We've also got Randall Cobb. He hasn't been massively explosive in every game, but based on how good he was just in one game so far and and his ability to be at least somewhat decent the rest of the weeks is rated as the 12th best wide receiver in football right now. We've also got a handful of guys that have not really broken out yet. Alan Lazard, (laughs) this is pretty shocking, is rated 101st out of 106 wide receivers. He's one of the worst, lowest graded receivers in football right now. I don't expect it to stay that way. I don't know why he's off to a slow start. I don't know exactly what's going on with Lazard, but I fully anticipate him getting much, much better. Same with Tunyon, who is 55th out of 70. He has not had a massive impact, but he is. these are two guys that Aaron Rodgers really likes and he really trusts. And they've been able to get by with no MVS, essentially no Lazard and no Tunyon, and, and one game of Randall Cobb. Otherwise, it's been Adams and a couple running backs. And again, whether they can run the ball with speed and agility with Aaron Jones or power and decisiveness with A.J. Dillon, They have two running backs that can be receivers. Again, Aaron Jones, who's able to zip around and get around the corners and safeties, or A.J. Dillon, where you throw it to him in the flat, and he's bulldozing corners. You've got Adams, who I said can do everything. You've got a slot guy. You have a wide receiver that can block. You have tight ends that can catch and can block. And the entire defense or the entire offense is predicated on you have no idea what's going to happen because all the plays look the same. But what the play is actually going to be, you don't know. And that, by the way, is largely designed to make sure Roquan Smith cannot act fast enough. And so with your safeties not performing very well, only having one quality corner, questionable defensive lineman, and at, at, at best, one really capable linebacker, I'll, I'll grant you that Smith is very good if that's what you want. It's not really a fight that I care too much about. If you want to say that PFF is not only wrong, unbelievably wrong, and that Roquan is maybe the best linebacker in football, they think he's on the lower end of that, that's fine. I haven't watched his tape. Presumably you have. You draw your own conclusions. The point is, there are weaknesses on this defense despite the production. 
despite the fact that you're seventh, there are guys that are not the greatest football players in the world, and the Packers are the kind of team that are going to exploit that. This is the bad matchup for the Packers. The good matchup is when the 30th ranked offense, 32nd in terms of yards, dead last, has to go up against our defense. Yeah, but your defense isn't very good. Eh, I don't know about all that. I would say it's very similar to what the Bears are. If you look at it in terms of talent, you're probably right. Amos and Savage have not really turned a corner and been as productive. We don't have Zadarius. We don't have Jair. That's a problem. We don't have Kevin King, which, believe it or not, is a problem. But look at the results. Again, if you take away week one, which you can call that unfair if you want, but what they've done the last four weeks, which is more indicative of what you're probably going to see, that's the reason why I would do that. Because you can keep it in there and allow that to uh, alter the numbers to give you a number that you like more. But the question is, what defense are you more likely to find? The aggregate of all five weeks or the aggregate of the last four weeks? Well, the last four weeks is more indicative of the team that you're probably going to be playing. And if you look at that, I believe their rank is either 11th or, or 10th, 10th or 11th. So they're basically around a top 10 defense, pretty close to with all the injuries. The biggest issue, though, is it's not focusing on the struggles of the defense, even if I grant you that this is a terrible defense, even if we pretend that Stokes really hasn't gotten burned at all and pretend that Savage and Amos are, even though they aren't as good as they were last year, very capable safeties, even if we pretend Campbell isn't one of the best linebackers in football right now and that Gary and Smith are very productive and Kenny Clark is a top 10 defensive tackle right now, even if we pretend all of that isn't the reality, and pretend that they haven't been quite productive, and pretend that teams really aren't running up the score on the Packers. And if you remove all the garbage time nonsense and uh, flukish garbage nonsense plays like uh, one of the Bengals' touchdowns, they've been pretty stingy. But even again, if we just remove all of that, say they're terrible, they're horrible, they can't do anything, what are you going to do? You got to be able to move the ball. How are you going to do it? This is a team that has come to the realization last week. Laser took over, right? Laser, Blazer, the whole uh, American Gladiator family. They took over the Chicago Bears and they said, listen, I, I know how to make this work. And he was right. They did. They found a good plan. You know what the plan was? Take the ball out of Justin Fields' hands, who was ranked 33rd out of 35 quarterbacks, and run the ball a lot. And again, the star running back is on IR. The number two running back is now on COVID IR. He's not going to be playing this week. And the other running back who is there, uh, Mr. Herbert, is a guy that is not going to be taking a heavy load. I think combined, there were over 30 carries, like 34 carries, something like that, by the Chicago Bears. Herbert's not getting 34 carries. He's not getting 30 carries. I would be stunned if he gets 25 carries. So what do you do? Do you just scrap everything? Do you just laser? Again, he figured it out. He figured out how to make the Bears work. Do you just get rid of all of that and say, you know what? We're going to have to turn this around. You're going to have to sit in the pocket and throw and distribute to Mooney and Robinson, and that's how we have to beat the Packers and this team that's actually done quite well defensively and and to be able to keep up with the Packers rather than grinding down the clock by running the ball over and over again, grinding down the defense, taking the ball out of Aaron Rodgers' hands. Instead of doing that, I got to trust you to stand in a shaky pocket and distribute the ball to a team that's actually been quite good in terms of takeaways. Either way, it's not a good situation to be in. Either way, you're in a lose-lose situation. You either scrap everything that you did, everything that you realized works, and go with a complete opposite game plan, which it's not a matter of, well, you know, that's what we did last time, we're going to do this and it's going to work. You built that game plan because you knew that that's how you can win with this roster. You're just going to scrap that now and say, let's just do the exact opposite? That would be like the Kansas City Chiefs just on a dime saying, you know what, we're going to be a run-first team. Oh, I mean, you okay. Um, that's not going to work, though, right? I mean, it's like we're going to run the ball like 50% of the time and Mahomes is there just to kind of like, run a couple play actions and dump the ball off and distribute the ball, you know, like three yards down the field on average. Um, You can do it, but the point is you build the game plan because it's what's going to work. You can't just change it because, well, we don't have running back. I mean, you can because maybe you have to. But the point is, again, Fields right now is one of the worst quarterbacks in football according to his, his grades. His stats are not very good. Nothing is good. 
The offensive line is bad. With the exception maybe of Peters, Whitehair is rated 32nd out of 71, Mustafer is 33rd out of 35, Daniels is 41st out of 71, Wilkinson has not really played very much yet. He doesn't even have a rank because he hasn't played enough, but he's your backup to a guy that was not very good anyways. And they're going to have to try to protect Fields, who's sitting in a pocket. And if we do try to run the ball a lot, we either have to grind Herbert into the ground, which maybe we're going to do that because, hey, it's just one week. Let's load him up, give him 25, 26 carries. He'll be fine for one week doing that. Or we got to bring somebody else in. We got to call somebody up from the practice squad, which I would think had would have had to have happened by now. Or we run Nall, who is not the kind of guy you want running the ball. Lose-lose situation. And this is a new problem right? This isn't even describing the 30th ranked offense. This is the 30th ranked offense that no longer can do what it did to make it look competent last week when you scored 20 points. Now we're looking at it going, I don't know how we get to 20 this week because we don't have what we had last week to get us to 20. Final score prediction, Packers 25, Bears 10. I was going to say 14, but it makes sense considering the red zone efficiency. Maybe I'll say 14. I don't want to. I'm going to say 10. 25 to 10. There might be a garbage time touchdown that gets them to 17 or some flukish halftime thing, but I think they should be less than what the Steelers were. 14 does kind of fit right, doesn't it? Doesn't matter. Whatever. 25, 14. Who cares? Doesn't matter. Point is, it's going to be a bit of a a shellacking. And although it may be nerve wracking at first, and maybe the Bears even get the first touchdown. I don't know. That's usually what happens is, is the other team comes out hot we start to feel very inadequate, like this is not good. Then when the second quarter rolls around, that's when the Packers load up all their points and then just kind of coast for the rest of the game. 25-14 is your final score prediction or 25-10, whichever one suits your fancy. Don't really care. You can call it 25-17. But that's what we got. I'm going to leave it at that. You folks have yourselves a fantastic Sunday. Join me tomorrow for Victory Monday, where we celebrate the game that was and the glories therein. I don't know why I said that sentence, but you folks have yourselves a great day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.